Hello, and welcome to Multifamily Investing Made Simple, the podcast that's all about taking the complexity out of real estate investing so that you can take action today. I'm your host, Anthony Vecino, joined as always by Dan. Insert nickname here, Kruger. We're struggling today. It's been a long <laughs> 24 hours. This is being recorded the Friday after Ooh. Thanksgiving. A bit stuffed. What is it? Tryptophan? Is that what's in turkey that makes you tired? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't have... A, actually, I had a whole turkey leg yesterday, but I think what's making me really tired is that we went to... The, my family goes to the Golden Corral because... We're classy don't people. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need a reason <laughs> for going to Golden Corral. We do, though. Um, so I'm still in recovery mode. I don't know about you. Yes, I am in recovery there mode. There is literally not. nothing at Golden Corral my body can digest within a week. I can't. Mm. Like, yeah. <laughs> I have a pretty good body. I can't say I've ever been. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine that that's going to go smoothly. Buffets. You get what you pay for. <laughs> $12 for all you can eat. Here we There's are. Here Anyways. We are. So, Dan, I think this is going to be a pretty interesting episode today as we talk about six problems that we solve for investors. If you are an active investor who is looking to raise capital from private investors, then you probably also can solve these six problems for your investors. If you are a passive investor and you have a problem, my guess is it will revolve around one of these six things. And if not, well... Let us know. Let us Why know because we're list. trying to compile a list of what are all the problems that investors have. We only got six we so got far. Six. Yeah, we couldn't even make it to seven. <laughs> like seven's a way better title, right? But no, six. Anyways, before we get to that, Dan, as always, go slinging that bad advice. Mm. All righty. I got you. Bad advice for the week is uh, a good investment is always going to have high returns and low risk. Sounds I'm like just, good advice, right? I'm just writing this down. I'm making notes. Yeah, you should write that down. High returns, High low, returns risk low risk equals a bad investment. Equals amazing investment. Oh, amazing investment. Right. And that's bad advice. So why is that bad? I feel like if I was getting a high return and low risk, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty good. Except if you give that advice to somebody, it doesn't really add any value. It doesn't really help them. A, because high returns, well, that's kind of relative. Like, what is that? It kind of depends on what the person's looking for. And B, the most important part, the part I want to actually dive into is how do you even quantify the risk on a deal? And we've talked about this a lot on the podcast. And so you've heard us talk about this. But if I tell somebody, look for something that's got high returns and, and low risk, uh, they're not going to know what to look for in a deal unless they listen to our content, in which case they probably do. Um, but <laughs> look but at that's you. my problem. Look at you plugging the, the oh, podcast shucks. on the podcast. Yeah, we're going to link to a few episodes below. But yeah, I mean, the, the risk <laughs> thing is is really almost impossible to, to quantify with, with a number. Mm -hmm. And so the, that advice of find something that's low risk, high return doesn't really do people very, uh, very much good. And so, you know, the high return thing is kind of relative for some people it might be 15, 20% a year. You know, if you're 80 years old, heck 8% might be a high return, right? So it's all kind of relative, but specifically on the risk piece, just saying that you want a low risk deal is not really going to get you very far. You need to uncover what makes a low risk deal a low risk deal. And specifically, you want to be looking at the underwriting assumptions in the deals that you're looking at. You want to look at the assumptions that are made in that pro forma on the cap rate, on the rent growth, uh, and, and just the business plan in general and figure out if those seem reasonable. If those assumptions are realistic and achievable, and if the uh, assumptions have been stress tested, and that would probably qualify as low risk as long as those things uh, seem like they're likely and realistic. So I guess that's kind of the qualifying thing is the advice I gave is actually good advice. As long as you know <laughs> how to identify what makes a low risk deal, a low risk, deal, a low risk deal. Yeah. Risk is such a loaded word. Context matters a lot. And there's a lot of different variables that you can take into play. And the way that I define it is maybe going to be slightly different than the way you define it. It should be. And so it's, it's all relative to the individual. And so low risk is a meaningless statements and, and the same with high risk or I'm sorry, high returns. The, the thing that we were talking about the other day was, um, people asking, Oh, we're at the top of the market and prices are way overvalued or really they're all time highs. Right. And my question is always high relative to what, right? Relative to median income, relative to cost of living, relative to the cost of buying a house, relative maybe to yesterday, maybe not, maybe not so high. Right. And so 
high is always relative. So is low and, and risk is God, the most ephemeral of terms, but I will say that when it comes to risk specifically within real estate, I think about three different types of macro level risks. So you have operational, you have market and you have deal level risks. Operational is mitigated by having great operators. Market risk is mitigated by being in a great market and deal risk is mitigated by having conservative underwriting. So just from boom, there you go. Use that as you look at risk and how you try to quantify it. Good, Cause good luck. There is no number. So yeah, exactly. You got to figure out what your risk tolerance is for yourself. Here's, here's something else that I want to talk about real quickly on this topic. I was, I was working with a, um, a coaching client the other day who had in the beginning of his career was buying up a bunch of single families, duplexes and things like that. And one of the interesting things that we got on the topic of is the fact that one, it's not the greatest use of your time and it's not very efficient. The multifamily evaluations, like there, there are, there's so many reasons just to go into bigger properties. But one of the things that came up in that was he was playing a game where there was um, mitigated risk, but very capped upside. And I was like, what's the point of playing a game where there's like very little risk, but also no upside, right? Like the, you, it seems like a waste of time. It seems like exactly. It's like, well, you, the risk is that you're wasting your time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, Nassim Taleb talks about the bar barbell strategy or asymmetric returns where you're looking for capped risk with infinite upside, mm -hmm. right? And the reverse of that is usually the type of investing most people do, which is they have capped upside and unlimited risk. This was... I'm not going to say he had unlimited risk. He definitely had risk, but it was really capped risk and capped upside. And I was like, what's the point? You pretty much buying a bond at that point and better just, to, I don't know, put your money in a blender. Yeah. It's just not an efficient use of time or capital. I don't know anything about the situation you're talking no. about, but <laughs> just that simple paradigm of limited upside and limited downside. It just seems like you might as well just uh, go on vacation and not waste your time and money on whatever this thing is. Yep. It's a, and that, that's something that we were talking about a little bit earlier is always evaluating what's the highest and best use of your time or of this resource. Um, I think Tony Robbins says something that is pretty smart, which is you don't lack for resources. You lack for resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. And like if you're using your resources poorly, then you have nobody to blame but yourself. So, mm -hmm. All right, so let's get into the meat and potatoes or the turkey and gravy of today's episode, which is six problems we solve for investors. And again, this isn't just unique to us at Invictus. This is anybody that's an active investor out there who works with private investors, or if you're an LP, you might resonate with some of these, some of these problems. Some of the things that investors, when they come to us and we say, hey, why are you here? What do you want? Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? These are the things that they say. So listen closely because this might be you. Oh, number one, in no particular order, might I add, usually we have some sort of ascending or descending order here. This is just the order in which we came up with them. But uh, one of the problems that we have, and what we're really looking at for our list is uh, we've looked at what our investors have been talking to us about. So the people who have come through um, through our uh, our funnel, for lack of a better word. And we've got a you know fairly niche down focus to who we work with. So this is probably going to vary across the board, but for the guys that come in, guys and gals that come through our, our funnel, the things we hear about the most, uh, number one is returns. I was actually just meeting with somebody today who has not invested with us. He's a friend I've known for a while. Um, but he and his family are in the process of of diversifying, and and what he told me was in our our meeting that his his father and, and their um, their parents historically have had a very old school kind of mindset with where they put their capital and they'd 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 acquire a lot of assets, but none of them really had a yield. There's no real cash flow. So one of the biggest uh, problems that we solve for investors is generating yield or returns, right? So if people are investing in things that don't have any kind of cash flow or any kind of income stream, that's a problem, right? You're, you're betting entirely on the appreciation of the asset and you don't get paid to wait. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's a problem for people. If they're investing in things that don't have any kind of yield, you could be, you should be. Well, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, what's, what's money, but if, but not a tool, right? Like a tool for ideally buying back your time and living life on your terms. And it's hard to do that when your money is tied up into something that can't be easily translated into cash money and doesn't something doesn't help you pay your bills today. Right. And so cash flow is a great asset. I, and one of the things that comes to mind when you said that, like they buy a lot of assets that don't have yield. I'm like, are they buying yachts? Because people sometimes buy yachts. And I don't think they're buying yachts. <laughs> but, but that's like an example of like an asset out there that would not probably, it, it might 
conserve your your wealth it might hold its value kind of well but it's not going to be putting cash back into your pocket but well, one you of can the park it in whatever tax district you want that's a nice part about that's it. true yeah. that's true <laughs> the other part of the returns that people are looking for is they want to beat the stock market they want to do better than average like and when they look at the returns of a say a syndication or like whatever your type of deal is like generally what i'm seeing in the market these days for syndications is somewhere between 15 and 20 percent irr you get some people who are like projecting 30 percent irr that's crazy. Um, and you get people who come under 15, but generally it's in that range, which is really strong when you look at that relative to the stock market. So that's one of the biggest things people are looking for. Like I want to outpace the stock market. So we're like, so do we. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so number two, and this is tied very closely with the bad investing advice of the day. And so Oops. let's, let's tread lightly into this one. But number two, investors are looking to mitigate risk the heck does that mean man there's just so many and again it's loaded right like there's so many different ways that we can mitigate risk and different investors are looking for different things so dan what are some of the more common things that people mean when they say risk yes yeah, I'd, say, I'd say that one of the most common ones that we hear on calls that are uh, coming from people that we're having that come in through our, our funnel is that uh, they perceive overexposure to a particular asset class like the stock market to be risky right so they're looking to um, get exposure to something that's not correlated um, that could be one one uh, way to look at at the risk uh, uh, paradigm. But then the other one could be the cash flow thing I just mentioned, right? If you're investing in something and hoping for appreciation, uh, getting cash flow in the interim while you wait for that to happen reduces the risk profile. So there's a bunch yeah. of ways we can kind of unpack here's, this one. Here's one that's really pertinent right now, especially in the last year and a half, two years or so since we've been printing money like it's going out of style, is one of the biggest risks is inflation, right? It's going to eat away at the, the value of your money. You just put that under your, your mattress and it's going to be worth a little bit less than it was last year. So you want to look for something that's a good inflationary hedge. Well, there's very few places that are better than real estate, a real asset that inflates along with everything else. Mm-hmm. So that's one big risk. I would say another big risk, especially when people are coming to us and what we do with big multifamily assets is the size and scale of the asset is inherently stable um, because it's not predicated on one tenant or two tenants. There's And also because the valuations of these buildings moves very slowly. Real estate is like a big ocean tanker, whereas the stock market's much more like a, a nimble speedboat out there on the waves. And the reason for that is liquidity, which we've said before, it's a feature, not a bug, Right liquidity in the stock market you can get in and out real quick and that's what's making the valuations get all wobbly whereas in the real estate it's going to take you a couple months if you want to just sell a, a big multifamily asset and so the valuations move much slower which means your money's probably not going to just disappear overnight mm-hmm. probably yeah and one other thing on on the risk component is just the fact the matter that you're investing in something that is a basic human need and that is very unlikely to go out of style in the next couple of years. If you're investing in equities and companies, I mean, look at Peloton and Zoom. Uh, 12 months ago, those things were the hottest thing on the street. Now they're just falling apart. Right? Yeah, what happened to them? I mean, they just <laughs> the, the growth they saw wasn't wasn't a long term thing. It was just an, an interim uh, demand that wasn't going to be sustained, and people bid the prices up like crazy because they're all hopping on the bandwagon. Some might even so, say transitory demand. Ugh. I just want to put that word in there because I know it gets you all saucy. Transitory. <laughs> all right. So, risk. so number three, the number three problem, um, and again, these aren't ranked in hierarchy. They're just the order that we wrote them out of our brain. Number three is taxes. It's not about what you make. It's about what you keep. And at the end of the day, the biggest expense you're likely to pay in your lifetime are taxes. So anything that you can do to mitigate taxes, even just a little bit, is going to go a long way. Yeah, this is a big one, especially with those individuals who are uh, self-employed and or have some significant windfalls. Um, if people are getting hit on the tax end really aggressively, like if they're high paid professionals or something like that, they're sick to death of paying taxes. And so they're looking at trying to increase their income in 
uh, a more tax efficient way. So there's not a whole lot that a really high paid doctor can do to wash out the, the tax liability on the earned income. But what they can do and what a lot of people do who, who are coming into our uh, our sphere and, and having calls with us and getting into our deals is increasing uh, the income that's coming in from passive sources because that passive income is a heck of a lot more tax efficient. And over time, they can have a larger and larger proportion of their total income be coming from that passive income. So that's one of the most common strategies I've noticed with individuals who are uh, higher net worth or higher income. Yeah, and this is important to start now and not wait. If you're if you're a high net worth lawyer, doctor, entrepreneur, business owner, now is the time to start taking funds and putting them into these assets not in 15, 20 years, because in 15, 20 years, you're going to get to a place where you're like, you know, what? I'm ready to hang it up. And if you don't already have those alternative income streams set up and, and rocking on all cylinders, you're going to be really bummed when you try to leave your job and you're like, hmm, if I stop working now, I don't have enough cash flow coming in to really maintain the quality of life that I've become accustomed to. So if you start now and it doesn't even have to be a ton, we've done, we've done models on this where just even $50,000 a year invested into syndications or any kind of real estate is going to snowball so quickly, especially when you factor in cash out refinances, it's going to snowball so quickly that in 10 years, you're going to be in a position where you don't have to keep working. You get to choose how many hours you work. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that people don't really have on the radar, usually until pretty late in life when it's already becoming a problem. And it's 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 a good problem to have. I mean, if you're getting tax lot, that means you're making a lot. So good for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it'd behoove you to to be proactive about that. And like I said, you're not really going to be able to wash out that active income tax on the earned income. But if you can accumulate more tax efficient income on the side that highly taxed income from your job is going to become less and less important. And to Anthony's point, you'll be able to walk away a lot easier if you've already got a bunch of passive stuff churning over here that's getting taxed at a much lower rate. So now, if you have a spouse who is in real estate, you could utilize the real estate professional status. That's awesome. We did an episode on that. So if you're making a ton of money and you got a spouse who's like just sitting on a couch all day, you know, go look up the real estate <laughs> professional status, go listen to that episode. It might be able to save you a, a ton of money. It's not super easy, but it's worth exploring. Now, number four on our list, and this one's actually um, very tied to what we were just talking about with um, lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs, like these high net worth people who are earning really good money. Number four is diversification. And diversification can mean a lot of things. Like one you mentioned earlier is like not being correlated to the stock market, right? Like that's great. We want non-correlated assets. But the other part that I think about is that a lot of business owners that we work with, they are great at building their business. That's what they've been doing for the entirety of their their adult life. And they, they've made this thing where they just keep reinvesting back into it. And it's a powerful vehicle, but now it's the only egg that they have in their basket. And if that egg cracks for whatever reason, they're like, what do I do? And so what we like to do is work with entrepreneurs and business owners to help them like start to diversify out of just investing into their business and create alternative streams so that you can get to a place in your life where if you don't want to be working in your business all day, you don't have to. If your significant other is like, hey, you know, I want you to pull back and stop. uh, Let's go live our life and stop building that thing. You can Mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. I mean, at a certain point, Jamie's going to make you. She's going to make me at some point. Inevitable. Um, no, but yeah, it's, that's an amazing point because you made the comment there about the, you know, if you put all your eggs in that one basket and the, and the basket cracks, eggs crack. Anyways, you know, if, if the basket's issue, fine, the basket will be yeah. fine. <laughs> if, if you're, uh, if, if you're putting all your money into, to one thing yourself, your business, there's, there's some risk there, but at the, the other side, I mean, honestly, I think the lowest risk bet any day is yourself, right? You're probably the most powerful and, and most uh, uh, trusted steward of your own capital um, in most cases for most people. But I think the bigger <laughs> risk there isn't necessarily that your uh, your business is going to fall apart. Uh, I think it's more so that how many hours do you have in the day? If you keep investing in your business, that's that's active for you, right? You're investing in something that you're actively participating in, actively managing and actively involved in. And there's only so many hours, so many hours in the day. So at some point, you're going to have to take some of that capital and put it into something that doesn't require any additional time any, any additional input from you. And so that's usually where a lot of people are that are, that are coming to us. They've got capital and they have been investing in, into their business. And if they do that again, it's probably going to require some input from them in addition to the capital, but they don't want to do that. And so that's where it kind of becomes in, in, imperative to start putting money into passive endeavors because there's only so many hours in the day. 
Building businesses is hard. Uh, I, I think everybody should own a piece of a business and own a piece of commercial real estate. But let's be honest, like building a business is hard work and it's a whole lot more fun. I found to build a business when your life doesn't depend on the success or failure of that business to be able to build it because you want to, because you're passionate about it is a whole lot better than building it and then relying on that thing for your sole source of survival and diversifying some of your eggs can help you do that so that building business isn't just this albatross around your neck that's stressful it, hanging over your head all the time. You're not dreading anymore. You go and you, you build it because you love it. So that's diversification. That's one of the more common ones that we see in, in our sphere. But number five on the list is actually probably the most common mm -hmm. in the grand scheme because we work with passive investors. So it is obvious that most passive investors come with the problem that they don't have enough time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most people that come into our sphere are coming in because they, they know they want to invest in real estate. They, they understand the value. They understand what a great asset class it is to get into. And they don't want to be a landlord. They don't want to sit down and study everything that you need to know in order to be successful as a real estate investor. And then in, even to get uh, to, even if they get to that point, they they do all the study, and then they've actually got to go out and find properties and manage them. Even if you get a property management company, it's it's a full time job, and people don't want to leave their job just to invest in real estate. Like they recognize that real estate's amazing, great resource for all of the reasons that we've kind of mentioned up until now, uh, but they don't want to quit their job to switch to a new job and you know be guys like us, which is fine. Um, and that's that's really the biggest. One of the most common things I think is like they all realize that this is a great resource, um, but they just don't have the extra 12 hours to go out and start a new business. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I love real estate now and I'm obviously very deeply entrenched in it, but you know, I've shared my story before where 15 years ago when I was in college, that was my first intersection with real estate in the form of fix and flips that my roommate and his dad were doing. And I remember thinking, man, real estate sucks. I don't want anything to do with this because it was so active and I was doing the construction. I was like, I hate this. And then a number of years later, I got into a couple of quads with a buddy, but I passively invested and he did everything. And I was like, this is great. I, I love real estate. I don't have to do anything. This is fantastic. And it was only a, a number of years after that where I finally got bit by the active investing bug. But gosh, for those that period of time when I discovered that I could invest in real estate passively and not do the work, I was like, this is this is nirvana. This is the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's powerful. I mean, if you can, um, I mean, that's infinitely scalable. I think that's the whole point is yeah. if you're not, uh, investing your time into a thing and you're just using capital, you can scale that machine to the moon, mm -hmm. um, which is really powerful and exciting. So, all right. Number so, six, number six. And this one is an interesting one. You used the word earlier in this episode. So I wonder if any of our, if our audience, if you're listening at home, this one is not a super intuitive one, mm. but Dan used the word earlier. Did I? It's a very unique word. I don't listen so if you myself. heard it and you have a guess of what this next one is, I want you to take a second, go over to Apple, go to iTunes, go find us, Multifamily Investing Made Simple, and then leave a review. And in the review, I want you to make a guess about what you think number six is going to be on this list. Now, remember, Dan did say the word earlier in this episode in context of something else, but it's such a unique word that once you hear it, you're going to be like, oh yeah, okay. All right. We'll just sit here in silence do, for about do, three minutes. Do, do, do. Okay. Now <laughs> you guys could pause, you could, whatever. Now, number six, mm. Dan, what is it? Number six is windfall. 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 I don't know why I said it quietly. It's, um, <laughs> it's probably a loud word because it's big and windfall. it's, it's actually a good problem. It's good to, um, good I mean, if you're a, let's say you're a business owner, self-employed individual and you sell your company, or maybe you just sell products and, and they, uh, they go in waves. And so every so often you've got a big influx of capital coming in. Uh, that could be a problem. It's a good one, but uh, you got to figure out what to do with that. Because to Anthony's point earlier about inflation, if that's just sitting in the bank doing nothing, it's losing buying power every single day. So cash actually is a problem these days. And uh, if you find yourself in that situation, good job. Good job. Congratulations. You did to get that yeah. windfall. Yeah. Hopefully you didn't traffic some heroin or something. But assuming you did something legal and legitimate, great job. Is trafficking heroin illegal everywhere? Um, I Probably not. Asking for a friend. Um, Never mind. Keep continuing. 
Uh, I haven't done, I haven't, I haven't looked up where you can legally traffic heroin. Um, probably Antarctica. I don't know if you can probably get away with anything. I'm there. guessing there's some places where it's not <laughs> illegal. I'm just wondering. I don't know. Yeah. As you said that, I was like, I'm sure somebody out there has a very legitimate smuggling heroin business. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. You can. Well, actually, um, uh, big Purdue, pharma Purdue. Yeah. There you go. So nailed it. All right. So anyways, anyways, that's that a first. different episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, windfall. Where was I? I lost my train uh, of thought entirely. So <laughs> congratulations. If you had a big windfall, unless you're the yes, heroin person, unless right. you're, um, that yeah, one so heroin, heroin cash person. Is, cash is a problem. If you mm-hmm. got it and it's not in something that's going to, uh, shield it from inflation, that could be an issue. And this is one of the, uh, not quite as common, but we've had a handful of individuals who have this. They sold a business. They just had a bunch of cash dumped on them, and they've got to put it somewhere. Um, real estate comes in handy for that. This is this is interesting. It's actually, I think, more common than a lot of people even realize. Like until earlier today, until you mentioned it, I was like, oh yeah, that actually is a really common issue. Which is, you know, you have a big insurance windfall for whatever reason. Somebody dies, that sucks. Or you have an inheritance, or you sell a company. Like there's all these reasons that you might suddenly find yourselves holding a lot of cash. And that's an interesting problem because for a lot of people, let's say they have an inheritance and they just inherited $600,000. And before that, they've been making $70,000 every single year. So like 600,000 is a huge number and they don't know what to do with it. Suddenly and they're like, oh my God, what do I do? I want to do right with this. I don't want to mess it up. Um, they, and there's so much stress involved with that. And Mm -hmm. so for us in particular, because we lead with education, we have a book and a podcast and people come to us because they're like, what should we do? And we're like, this is what this is what we do. Don't know what what you should do necessarily, and this is a vehicle where we can help you. But it is it is a good problem to have in the sense that like, yeah, you got all this money, you got to figure out what to do. But that doesn't make it any less stressful, mm-hmm. especially like especially God if it's an inheritance or God forbid it's because you inherit like you it's an insurance payout because somebody you love died. Like those are horrible reasons. But then that comes with the emotional stress of like. I, I want to do right by this money. My grandma, my Grammy left me this. Mm-hmm. I don't want to like besmirch her hard work and her life by just like throwing this down the toilet. So like yeah. there's a lot of emotion built into this one there or if is. you sell a company. Yeah. And I've got a, I've got a friend who uh, had the situation as well. And I remember him um, uh, talking about, you know, why he was, you know, keeping it in cash for so long. Uh, and it was because of the stress of knowing that this was money for, uh, his little kid's college fund. He didn't want to screw it up and he had not been studying how to invest. He's, you know, and uh, he's just not in that industry. And like most people just wasn't super educated on what to do with your money outside of just throwing it into mutual funds. And, you know, he was educated enough in finance to know that that just didn't feel quite right for him, mm-hmm. but it was a lot of stress knowing that like, Hey, I've got all this capital that I need to uh, be a shepherd for, for my child, I don't want to screw it up. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure to have. And so, you know, I told him, uh, back then that I was like, Hey, just, yeah, inflation is a bitch. It's going to eat your money away, but don't do anything until you understand exactly what you're doing. Cause it would be much better to lose some buying power to inflation than to jump into something because you felt like you had to invest and then find out six, eight, ten 10 years later that maybe that wasn't the best move. So yeah, as they say, doing nothing is better than doing something stupid, mm-hmm. which is actually a really good segue into a book I wanted to recommend today. Oh, you got one too. Yeah, is, so we got a double book creeping in with all these book records. I'm trying. I'm trying to you know, you know show people that I'm a I'm a well read man as well. I want them to respect me. <laughs> I didn't reader. until now. Now I realize you read books, and I think you're. Okay. I just, it just okay. elevated in your mind, right? A little yeah. bit. Back Smitch. when I wore glasses, he used to think I was smart, and then I got yeah, sick. Now and I now I see, see the truth. He's a fool. Anyway, so anyways, before before I get to the book recommendation, or my book recommendation, anything that we want to uh, – let's let's wrap, let's wrap up these six problems that we solve for yeah. investors. From the top, returns, risk, tax, diversification, time, and windfall. I almost said waterfall. Windfall. Could yeah. be a waterfall. I bet waterfall that sixth one threw some people. I bet that one like caught some people off guard. I hope so. Now, if now listen, if you did in fact guess that right and you left a review, I don't know, honestly, I, I have no way of auditing whether or not you left the review in time. There's no so way to check this. you could always retroactively just go back and be like, windfall. If you did, I want you to reach out. I'm going to send you a free copy of our book. It's going to be signed and it's going to have a breath mint in there. So, um, that, that's my, my little gift to you. A little Andy's, a little Andy's mint. 
So leave a review, get an Andy's Mint. That's all I'm saying. All right, so the, to the book review. Dan, do you want to lead off with your book? Sure. All right. I have no segue for mine. It's just a, a book review. Uh, <laughs> it's like you're not even trying. <laughs> I, I'm phoning this one in. Uh, no, this is actually a book that I read probably over a year ago. It's been a really long time. But I thought it was good because I'm really just – I love books that are um, kind of a, a – <sighs> I don't know how to describe it. They're they're a very detailed uh, description. Uh, what's that? Like picture books? No. no. <laughs> yes. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You already used that joke on me earlier. <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Focus. Um, no, I love books that are about uh, very detailed stories about uh, the building of a business or something like that. And and this book is actually about the building of a fake business, and it's called Bad Blood, and <coughs> it is about Theranos. So I think Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos is actually on trial now. This is she you is. Know, it, this all kind of blew up in her face a while ago, but she's just now getting into uh, uh, the trial. And that kind of reminded me about this book. I thought it was fascinating. But Isn't it's it like, crazy? Oh, it's insane. It's insanity. Insane. All of it. Like beginning to end, the whole story oh, the is like bonkers. Voice, it's, oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's incredibly entertaining and fascinating. And uh, it's it's not bad to read about this stuff because it makes you better at spotting shady, fraudy people. So that's another little you know sidebar, little bonus is, you read about that kind of stuff, then you're probably gonna be better at spotting it yourself. Although this one was nuts, and this she had a lot of absolutely cool, crazy. It's by John Kerry Rue. Hope I'm not butchering his name, but check it out. Bad Blood. They also did a, a movie on it. If you're more of a viewer than a reader, um, check it out. It's obviously very abbreviated compared to the book. The book has got so many details, which I found fascinating. Yeah, I'll second that. That that's an interesting, fascinating story. Mm -hmm. It's stranger than fiction. It's one of those situations where you're like, this can't be real. This really can't be happening in this day and age i'm reading a book this is not my book recommendation but i'm reading a book right now can't do this about dr brinkley who back in the early 1900s was a like a going between towns and selling like he's a doctor and he, was, he would be marketing like those like uh cure-all elixirs where it's yeah, like this will cure everything yeah. but what he did was he uh marketed a surgery oh. that uh oh. yeah that uh made men virile so it helped them, like infertile men by taking goat testicles and surgically applying them to men. It is who it is the craziest story. Anyways, that's not even my recommendation. I just want to let you guys know it's a crazy story. Um, life is weird. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Okay, so my segue was doing nothing is better than doing something stupid, which segues into my book my book recommendation, which is the road less stupid. But I think his name's Keith Cunningham. I might have that wrong. I haven't heard of this. I recommended it to you the other day. It's a business book. It is it is really good. It's about <laughs> you never listen. I get it. It's all about asking better questions. Oh, I um, now. Yeah, and I asking questions time. about what needs to get done in your business or in your life to be, to actually get to your goals. Because quite often, the three foot putt. Yeah. Well, no, it's kind of tangent, like kind of tied in, but um, it's just a really good book because I'm always fascinated with how other people think, and the more. I can, data points I can get for how other people, not just like how they think, but like the actual mechanics of what does your thinking time look like? Like what do you, how's that structured? What questions are you asking to try and get to the best answers? Because the quality of your questions dictates the quality of your answers, which dictates the quality of your results. I, I found this book. It's just really, really good. Um, so if you're an entrepreneur or you're just trying to like level up your own life, like it's a pretty, it's a pretty good read. I actually wrote it stupid. down this time. Oh, you're going to like it. I I guarantee. Every time you say that to me, I actually do really enjoy whatever it is. So I feel like I, I, I recently recommended the the Scarlet Lady Woman of Wall Street and I saw it on your desk and it's really it's really good for a very particular type of people. So I, I recommended it on it this yet. on this podcast once. So unless you're a particular type of person, maybe that book isn't for you. If you really like stocks and markets and like that's going to be for you, though. Yeah, it sounds like if you're into specifically historical markets, econ type stuff. Yeah. If you're that guy, it sounds like it's. And you like crazy stories about people doing like bamboozling each yeah, other. Yeah, but everyone likes that. Everybody loves that. But I think yeah. this one was like really like kind of historical, which is very historical. Particular which, type of person. Yeah, so. I think you'll like it. Anyways, those are our book recommendations. Go check them out. Bad Blood and The Road Less Stupid. 
you combine those two, like you're probably doing pretty good. The the goat nuts, right? The goat nuts. That's like make them believe by Dan Kennedy. It's a marketing book. I don't know if I want to read that. Is that the whole book about that guy, or is that he? It's all about him and his 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 marketing strategy. I don't know if I can because think about how good of a marketer he must have been to get people to go in on that cure. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, (laughs) like you gotta be amazing selling that. I guess you. Like he's not selling a Porsche good. or an iPhone, something that's like beautiful and easy to sell. He's like selling you a surgery that is I guess not very crazy. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Some things to learn. Yeah. Anyways, so that's going to do it for us, guys. We appreciate you taking some time to listen to the six problems that we solve and active inv- investors can solve for their passive investor brethren. If you got any value out of this, make sure that you go leave a review over on iTunes. If you want that Andy's Mint and free physical copy of Passive Investing Made Simple. Make sure you send me an email with a link to the review and then also an address that we can send the book and we'll get it out to and you. And that audiobook so too. Oh yeah. Also I mean, the audiobook came out. Yeah, kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. Because if you're listening to a podcast, you probably like audio stuff. Ooh, let me start so. my sales pitch again. Hey, do you like listening to things? <laughs> <laughs> sure you do. You're here. Anyways, that's gonna do it. Go get the audio book, go get everything, and we'll see you guys next week. 